Chinese and Latin American ties entered a new era with Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi's visit to Chile, Uruguay, and through the second ministerial meeting of the Forum of China and the CELAC. The multilateral framework will initiate further collaboration under the Belt and Road Initiative and Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, laying a solid foundation for the upcoming China-Latin American Forum this year. Presently, sluggish economic growth and dynamic political volatility, coupled with the steadfast and influential U.S. presence, create various challenges for Chinese-Latino relations. What is the extent of a current Chinese-Latin American cooperation? How does Latin America and the U.S. view growing Chinese presence in this continent? And how do we build more mutual trust and understanding to resolve obstacles we meet? to discuss the many issues related to China-Latin American cooperation and more. I'm very pleased to be joined in the Beijing studio by Professor Evandro Gabriel, the head of the Center for China-Brazil Studies at Gutulio Vargas Foundation's Law School and Professor Jiang Shixue from Shanghai University. We shall also be talking to Mr. Ho He Hanna, former Chilean ambassador to China via telephone. That's our topic. This is a dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. Before we start, let's take a look at this. Chile's port city of Valparaíso is one of Latin America's gateways to Asia. From here, products from the region are shipped across the Pacific. The old quarter is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Tourists still ride the funicular, built in the early 20th century. Alongside history, there are plans for a new high-speed train connecting this city with Santiago, over 100 kilometers away. Maria Silva has been a tour guide in Valparaíso for eight years. There's a lot of people very excited about the chance to uh, connect these two cities uh, very fast and it'll be very good uh, for a uh, stimulate economy. Local reports indicate the project will cost around 1.5 billion dollars. Travel time between this port city and the Chilean capital Santiago could almost half if this high-speed train project does move ahead. Now this is just one of the many infrastructure projects with Chinese involvement under discussion in Latin America. China is taking a more prominent role in this region and last year exports from Latin America and the Caribbean to China rose by 30 percent according to the Inter-American Development Bank. Officials at this weekend's China CELAC ministerial meeting will discuss joint cooperation. Chile's former ambassador to China believes the most vital aspect of the forum is to develop regional projects. And what I would like to see is not just, uh, you know, national uh, responses, but some sort of broader collective response from the region uh, saying that it is uh, interested in continuing to partner with China in pushing for Latin American development. The China Select meeting ends on Monday when officials plan to release a statement about the road forward for China Latin American relations. Joel Richards, CGTN Valparaiso. Look at this handsome man, Foreign Minister Wang Yi. He's very popular with the Chinese, uh, partly because of the proactive diplomacy that he undertakes. And perhaps from the very beginning of the 2018, look at what he uh, went through in Africa. The, the tour, the trip took him to at least three African countries. Now, in the wake of his African tour, he comes to Latin America. What do you think of the Chinese diplomacy at the very beginning of uh, 2018? Is it more about uh, South-South cooperation or further implementation of the ambitious vision of President Xi Jinping to carry out the Belt and Road Initiative? What are your thoughts, Mr. Jiang? Well, this meeting was arranged three years ago. Uh, as the first meeting of CELAC China Forum uh, took place early January 2015. At that time, it was decided that the next meeting will be held in Chile at this time of the year. But I still would like to point out that, uh, yes, you are right. Uh, that means China attaches great importance to South-South cooperation uh, because Africa and America are important partners of China in the age of globalization. So I would agree with you that uh, that means, uh, apart from a better relationship with the developed countries, China wants to have better relationship also with the South. And Professor Kadevala, do you think uh, Mr. Jiang indicates clearly that China uses our formidable presence and influence, our formidable presence and influence in developing countries to hedge against the growing uh, suspicions, if not the geopolitical rivalry coming from the West, particularly the United States, 
the United States that lists China recently as a strategic competitor along with Russia, militarily, politically, and economically, as if they're taking on China and as if we are making a comeback to the Cold War. What do you think of the Chinese proactive diplomacy in developing countries? It's a very good question. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fact that the presence of China in Latin America countries is very huge now. China is the first or second trade partner for all of mm, the majority of the, the countries in Latin America and one of the big investors, sometimes the main investors in those countries. So that's why the presence of China maybe is a kind could be seen a kind of a threat for the United States. But there is something I'd like to add. Uh, the, the approach that China is developing there uh, through the Belt and Road idea, for example, because when I think about the 19 decades, for example, uh, all the economic integration process developed in, within the South America, Central America, or even supported by the United States, for example, was based on uh, reduce the tariffs and non-tariff barriers, you know, and, and all or uh, inspired by European Union economic integration process. And uh, what is China is doing now is suggesting a different kind of integration, and probably this is the opportunity to discuss this in the forum China CELAC, because it's based on infrastructure. Well, diplomacy is said to be the extension of domestic politics in many ways. This year, along more than 10 Latin American and Caribbean countries will hold presidential and Congress, congressional elections and uh, my question, Mr. Jiang and Professor Gavale, what is the current political map in this region and uh, what can China benefit from in involving and engaging um, most of the Latin American countries except for those who still maintain official ties with Taiwan? Well, uh, several years ago there was a popular belief that uh, while Europe uh, was turning to the right and Latin America is turning to the left. Mm -hmm. uh, look at Chavez and Morales and all kinds of uh, different political figures on the left side. And uh, now in the past one or two years we are seeing a, a certain kind of turning off. The so-called pink tide is not on the center stage. And uh, some of the political figures on the right are gaining power. So many people say we are going to see a different uh, page of the political history uh, in this continent and uh, some people in the, uh, in the US are happy that uh, China will lose its political influence with the left. Now I want to point out that there, there's nothing to the with each other between the two, uh, two, uh, 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 two sides. I mean China wants to have relationship with any country which is governed by, by any political parties. And, uh, well, it's a time... Are you suggesting with the end of the Cold War, China uh, says goodbye to ideological, ideologically motivated you're right, you're diplomacy? Right, you're right. Because during the Cold War, we used ideology to take side. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. And I'm not sure if we have taken the right side of history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. Uh, well, uh, we, we believe that... Uh, so my friend would uh, say yes or no. Uh, Colombia is believed that will be a close friend of the U.S., right? But China has a good relationship with Colombia. Mm -hmm. So you cannot say which country, uh, well, on the left or, or, or on the other side, uh, 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 other side of the picture. Well, China wants to have a relationship, mainly in the economic field, with anybody in Latin America. But I'm afraid this scenario will quickly, will quickly change, not quite in favor of China. For example, uh, recently, the Pentagon, the State Department, the, the, the White House have all dis developed a consensus that China will be their public enemy or strategic competitor number one. In the area of the Asia-Pacific region, our neighboring economies, particularly those of ASEAN, will have to take side between the United States and China because the United States is getting tough on China. If you don't take, t take side with us, and that reminds of what George W. Bush said in the week of 911, if you don't take side with us, you will be our enemy. Now, given this uh, catch-22 situation, most of the small and medium-sized countries will have to be painfully taking side. Do you think that is likely to happen in Latin America? This is a good question and, of course, a good discussion here. But, uh, 
I have some doubts about this topic. The fa I, I mean, the, the fact that China, China has a lot of investments in some countries or in many countries in Latin America, for example, this means that they are also friend of China and friend of United States. I think there is a difference between, you know, commercial relations, trade relations, business, and also strategic uh, uh, relations or political relations. There is a difference, and we have to take to, to pay attention. My understanding that. of your analysis is that most of the Latin American economies are getting very practical instead of uh, using ideology, very much like China did. Uh, they hate to ideologically take side, and they just uh, look after their own national business stakes. I really don't know because, for example, if I look at the Brazil situation now, uh, the country is divided. You know, I think the, the ideology in a certain way is uh, uh, again uh, is on the stage again. So uh, the 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 Cold War mind in a certain way is there and they used by maybe by the United States, you know, to to develop. Uh, uh, I mean, the the the, the right wing movement, the right wing wave in that region. Thank no. you so much. Now, just let's look at the, 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 the so-called case story of Chile. Chile now is governed by a politician who is believed to be on the right side. And China continues to have good relationship with Chile. And in the past, Chile was governed by, so Chile was governed by the, uh, the, uh, the lady, which is to be the so-called left politician. Mm -hmm. Well, China keeps political relationship, economic relationship, the same way as Chile is governed by the right or left. Well, China it deserves credit for feeling mm -hmm. comfortable with the mm -hmm. free movement of the pendulum mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. from the right mm -hmm. to the left, depending on our very practical but substantial cooperation with the Latin American partners. Mm -hmm. According to the National Bureau of Statistics, China's direct investment into Latin America in 2016 was double the previous years. Well, it increased by more than three billion U.S. dollars going the other way. What do you make of such statistics? Uh, my information about the number is by now, the total stock of Chinese investment in the region is about uh, 170 billion U.S. dollars, the total stock. That means this region has become a hospital for Chinese investment. And uh, as you know, I'm not criticizing you, okay? <laughs> so people... You know, the essence of this program is to encourage scathing criticism okay. to okay. punch each other in the face <laughs> <No>. and to <laughs> fight so that I'll you know, feel credit you know, <laughs> you know, people there do not save much, okay? So the so-called capital accumulation is quite weak. And if you do not have strong capital accumulation, the investment is, is quite low. So that region needs foreign investment for the past, well, long, long time ago. So, Chinese, so the Chinese investment can make up for the shortfall of capital accumulation in the region. So Chinese investment is good for China and also good for Latin America. So it's a win-win. Not China wins and China wins again. It's a win, Chinese win and Latin American win. Well, I'm not sure about the political stability and the social order in developing countries such as uh, our friends and partners in Latin America since uh, up to 10 countries in this region will go through either presidential or congressional elections. Mm -hmm. The bipartisan politics actually means uh, if you copy the American model, anything but Bush, anything but Obama, anything but uh, Trump. So such a reversal, dramatic reversal, means political and business risks would increase drastically accordingly. What do you think of the Chinese calculations uh, about the return of our investment? Because uh, we are all business minded, right? I know. Uh, in my opinion, uh, during when the region was ruled by majority by the, the left wing parties, there, there was a project to integrate the region. So we have UNASUR, an international organization, we have the MERCOSUR, we have some projects to strengthen the South America, for example, relations among the countries there. Now I think there is a kind of a fragmentation. No project uh, develop, developed by the South America countries to strengthen their uh, economic cooperation. So that's why in a certain way I think this is an opportunity to China 
uh, to discuss in this forum, for example, some kind of project that can help the South America and Central America, uh, uh, a different kind of uh, economic uh, integration. Because the, the main challenge is there isn't any project in that region, a project together among the, the countries, a very concrete project. Despite the national consensus and the very powerful political will of the Chinese leadership to execute the Belt and Road Initiative, a lot of the voices coming out of China would be very careful about the risks of our infrastructure construction in developing countries in particular. In Latin America, Mr. Ambassador, Hohihana, can you hear me? Mr. Ambassador, in Latin America we have yes, some yes. strong factors of uncertainty such as uh, Venezuela. Um, this country faces uh, political instability between the ruling party and the opposition forces. Now, China has unfortunately established a formidable business presence there. Billions of dollars have been made in our investment. What do you think of uh, our concerns on the risks and return of the investment? What are your suggestions? Well, uh, let me tell you, the most significant uh, crisis we are facing in Latin America today is the situation in Venezuela. In fact, after uh, the uh, CELAC China uh, forum that will be held today, uh, tomorrow, uh, the uh, foreign ministers from the region, uh, some of them that form the Lima group, will stay on for another day to discuss the situation in Venezuela. So it is a very critical situation. And yes, uh, China uh, has uh, lent a lot of money to Venezuela and must look for ways to get it back. Um, so this is the first time I understand that China faces such a situation in which it is uh, a creditor to a country that is unable to pay it back. So it's a new challenge for Chinese foreign policy and uh, decision makers. We were discussing the American influence in, the, uh, in Latin America and opposition forces are said to be backed up and supported consistently by the United States. Because mm -hmm. some of yeah. the state-owned assets uh, actually came from the private ownership, uh, behind the private ownership stood the American uh, capitalists. Mm -hmm. And therefore, mm -hmm. do you think uh, politicians and people in such countries like Venezuela will have to take side between China and the United States? Well, uh, there, is, there is a problem there. Uh, Venezuela, on the one hand, has to uh, look for its own uh, economic interests. And on the other hand, it is being pressured very heavily, both uh, from Washington and from uh, quite a number of, of Latin American countries. Uh, as I said earlier, it's, it's a very significant crisis that is getting worse by the day. Some people say it will get worse before it gets any better. And it's a very big challenge for the government of President Maduro. I myself, quite frankly, don't see uh, an easy way out. Thank you so much. Professor Jiang Shishue, why is Santiago featured prominently in uh, uh, a map of cooperation within Latin America? I was told that uh, railway will soon be constructed, uh, connecting a port city with uh, San Diego. Do you think this will facilitate the flow of uh, commerce and uh, therefore contribute to the boom of uh, maritime commerce between China and Latin America? By the way, our exports uh, increased drastically over the course of last year. Yes, Chile, Chile is, uh, is quite nice to China. Chile has several firsts. Chile was the first country in South America to establish a diplomatic relationship with China. The first one in, in the region uh, was Cuba. Chile uh, was the first uh, country in the whole region to reach WTO agreement with China. Chile is the first country to have uh, FTA, free trade agreement, with China all over the world. Okay, ASEAN. ASEAN uh, was the first with uh, FTA with China, but ASEAN is not a, a kind of a country, it's a, it's a block. So Chile was the first one. And then uh, Chile uh, uh, had a, the so-called very, uh, very nice uh, uh, investment uh, treaty with China, all kinds of things. So I would say Chile is very nice, that's probably 
Chile uh, was chosen as, uh, as a seat for the second ministerial meeting of China. And after this uh, ministerial meeting, I believe Chinese investment will, will be seen in a big, big and a big number, no matter in Chile, in Brazil, or in any other parts of the continent. This year marks the 30th anniversary of the diplomatic relations between China and Uruguay. Last year, the China-led uh, 2017 Business Summit held in Uruguay has emphasized the challenges in improving trade and other ties with uh, China. And uh, uh, w w what are the expectations for China-Uruguay partnership? Anything special about this partnership? Of course, we are talking about a country that is uh, that has the agriculture as its main uh, product to export. And, uh, and a country that is well conducted with Argentina and Brazil market because of Mercosur. And uh, this relation between China and Uruguay could be also a relation that can uh, improve uh, the relation within China, for example, and Mercosur as an international organization. So Uruguay could be a country that can help to improve the relations among those countries together and China that Uruguay can play an important role in this way. Mr. Ambassador, what are your thoughts on Foreign Minister Wang Yi's visit uh, to Uruguay despite the implications of uh, the 30th anniversary? Yes, well, let me uh, say the following. Uh, what is remarkable about Uruguay is that uh, until now we have heard much about the strong the trade links between the bigger countries like Brazil, like uh, Argentina, like Chile, like Peru. But Uruguay's trade links with China have also skyrocketed. Last year, amazing as this may sound, uh, Uruguay exported more to China than it did to the U.S. and Europe combined, and more to China than it did to Brazil and Argentina, its big neighbors combined. So, uh, for Uruguay, the relationship with China is also becoming a key, a key relationship, and I think. Uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi will have a, a lot on his plate when, when he visits. The next major issue that concerns the prospects of China's relationship with the developing countries in, or in terms of South-South cooperation is the issue of solidarity. It seems uh, not all of the emerging markets would see eye to eye on the major issues. For example, China is not given ground or granted the market economic status by some of the emerging markets like Mexico. And do you think this will be a major problem? Um, second question for Professor Cavallo is, uh, uh, what do you think of the uh, future of regional integration within Latin America? Do you think uh, only when Latin America rises uh, together as a whole uh, can they break away with the American influence and can they be more independent in dealing with other major markets such as China uh, that has unfortunately been listed by the United States as a strategic competitor? First, Professor. Well, market economy status is very important for China. Uh, if you want to have the so-called anti-dumping tax, uh, you need to have the so-called third country comparison. But starting from December 2016, according to China's uh, uh, protocol of uh, WTO accession, there will be no more this kind of a third country comparison. So it doesn't matter whether you believe I am uh, market economy status or not. Uh, the European Union, the US, Brazil, well, w China does not care about uh, whether or not you recognize China as a market economy or not. Now, for, uh, for my friend, well, uh, that, that was 2004. Brazil recognized China's market economy status. Well, but that needs to be approved by, by your Congress. So sometimes Brazil still uses the so-called so third country comparison against China. Well, in the case of the United States, they would use a third country to launch anti-dumping and anti-investigation, anti-subsidies investigations. But uh, go back to, uh, uh, let, let's go back to uh, Latin American integration. Do you think uh, um, the enormous U.S. influence still serves as a drag on your political and economic momentum? Uh, let me tell you something. Uh, during the 90 decades, the United States had a project to develop a free trade area in all America's countries, in South and Central and North. And that this project was based on only the circulation of products, you know, to reduce the barriers and uh, no tariffs and non-tariffs uh, barriers, only this. 
This is uh, quite almost the same when we think about the TPP. So never the United States suggests to develop a kind of infrastructure to promote the real connectivity among the countries in Americas. So that's why I think China, uh, w uh, because of Belt and Road, could be a kind of a project that can inspire the South and Central America countries uh, to find a new project, more concrete, based in an infrastructure, in, and not so complex, for example, as the European Union, you know, uh, kind of a European Union integration project. So what we need, we need to improve our infrastructure to connect the, to connect the countries. And this could be uh, a, a good option to all South and uh, Central America to try again, you know, to try again to develop a kind of uh, integration process uh, among them. Yes, indeed. In this area, China will do more to help invest in the building of infrastructure. Now, in terms of regional integration, I'm afraid one thorn in the eyes of a Latin American government is uh, Cuba. Now, with Donald Trump uh, uh, taking office, uh, his administration uh, decides to um, somehow Going back. ban <laughs> American tourists from uh, traveling to this uh, Caribbean country. Now, what does that mean for China? Uh, Cuba uh, is perhaps is still in the shadow of uh, Fidel Castro. Um, the Organization of Americas and the Summit of Americas uh, really wants to bring Cuba into the orbit of their regional integration, despite the strong reluctance and even opposition from Washington. Mr. Ambassador, what's your take? Yes. Yes. Well, there's no doubt there's a big difference in the approach of the Trump administration to the one followed by Obama. President Obama visited Cuba and opened up many doors. There are some restrictions now uh, that have been implemented, as you quite rightly point out. But all the information I have is that uh, the number of doors that were opened were sufficient to produce quite a boost in tourism and in a number of trade areas and that is still very much going forward. Uh, the notion that somehow by uh, applying some restrictions uh, the Cuban government would fold, as it were, and give in uh, to Washington's demands have not proven to be correct. Uh, the, the Cuban government has uh, stood uh, by its principles for a very long time and it would not be cajoled into changing them. Thank you so much. Professor Jiang, do you think the current deterioration in Washington Havana relationship will result in the closure of the American embassy in Havana? No, no, no I don't no. think so. Well, uh, the U.S. Cuban relationship is a very interesting topic. So we should uh, be grateful uh, to former president of, of the U.S., Obama. Uh, he uh, he uh, just uh, so called normalized its relationship with Cuba. And I don't believe that Trump uh, has the courage to cut off this kind of relationship again. But, well, we need to pay more attention about what he's, he's going to do. Uh, not long ago, uh, there was a story, the so-called uh, sonic, uh, sonic incident between the, uh, between, uh, the U.S., uh, the so-called U.S. embassy officials. But I would say this story will be over very soon. And hopefully, uh, Cuba relationship uh, with the U.S. will be normal, uh, forever, and that is good also for China, you know, because China is sometimes caught in the middle of the road. So China wants to be friends with both Cuba and the U.S. Well said. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, Professor Jiang Shijie and Professor Gavalia, uh, we thank you so much for being part of this dialogue on the future of our relationship between China and Sri Lanka. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.